Hello? And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is a newcomer into the temple, a man behind Hello. numerous Hello. Um, OSR adjacent content, most recently the Gunslinger, the one mm -hmm. and only Taylor Lane. How you doing today, man? I am well. How I'm many rainbows well. have you gone through yet? Uh, two so far, but, um, I might drink more, uh, if I can keep the noise from being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but, thank you for coming on and, de and dealing with time zone hell. Oh. I usually, I usually open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So... Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Um, I was seven and someone explained to me that you could take pretend time and apply rules to it. Uh, and by the way, here's a book of uh, a bunch of monster pictures. And that turned out to be the monster manual. Um, and uh, reading it uh, and reading about all the all the monsters and, re and reading everything and playing it uh, was the most awesome experience of my entire childhood. Um, <laughs> um, and it's it's you know it's twenty two years later and uh, I'm still chasing that high. Uh, I guess. Mm -hmm. I can I can um, get that. Um. Yeah. When you say it was the Monster Manual, what, do you remember which version of it what it was? Yeah, third edition. Third edition. All right. Yeah, that the timeline for that would would certainly um, track. I usually end up asking that because if, if I've had some people say it was first edition, I'm like, okay, which which version of first edition are we talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there were there were a number. But no, no. Um I I don't know, it's it's funny. Um I actually have a certain degree of 3E nostalgia while also acknowledging that it was it was it was not a a, a good a particularly good edition. Um like by I don't know. Um I I don't I don't see hardly any 3e nostalgia which is really that's really interesting to me because it was one of the the longest periods of dominance that any edition had um but like no one no one today is like hey i'm gonna put um will and reflex and uh will saves in my new game um no one uh no, no one, no one really copies the mechanics. Uh, about the only counter example I can think of is uh, Kevin Crawford, who definitely has a certain degree of three influence in his without number games. Um, but even then, it's the without number games give me more of a BX vibe, honestly. Um. Yes, they do have a strong BX vibe, but there is a there is a large focus on feats. Uh, there are, in fact, the the three saving throws, which I, I haven't really seen anyone else do. Um, he uh, has a large degree of, of influence from like the intricacies of its combat. Uh, he cares a lot about like skill systems. Like there, there's if you know where to look, there is. 3E influence, it's just not as loud as his BX influence. I could see it. And um I yeah. do I do enjoy the without number um trilogy as it as it is now. I don't think it's gonna make it a quartet. As well as um Godbound, which I usually end up telling pe telling people 
instead of going with, say, Exalted 3rd Edition, go with Godbound instead, because I love Exalted, but 3rd Edition was a case of missing the point. I even made a whole video about it. Yeah. Um, and it, um, what What's your summary of your thoughts there? <sighs> so... I need I need to preface this with with a few things. Um, one of them is there, there's the fact that obviously Exalted was during the White Wolf era, um, as far as first and second edition. Third edition was um, through Onyx Path because of a bunch of really long and really stupid events that I don't have time to go into at this moment. But mm. there, I remember during the play tests for third edition. One particular thing that was very contentious among fans was the fact that there was no presence of Magitek, which had been in previous editions. And okay. Rich, the head of, um, of Onyx Path, had said, and I quote, Exalted is Wuxia and mythology. Now, that particular phrase I can, ta I can take apart with the sheer number of wrong things in it, but I ended up using that fr that phrase in the as the title for the video to kind of throw it to kind of throw it on its head. Because the reason the reason why I say that it is um, that they missed the point is third edition felt le felt like they were trying to generic fantasy exalted, and this is one particular game where doing that is the complete wrong move because. Right out of the gate, they made, back in back in second edition and in first edition, they made it explicitly clear that the Tolkien-esque Western European pastiche was not what they wanted to go for. They were not trying to do ha high fantasy pastiche vis-a-vis D and D or Pathfinder. What they wanted to do was epic fantasy. They cited th they cited things like the Iliad. They cited things like the manga RG Veda. Um, they cite, they cited a, a lot of anime and manga, especially, and a lot of console style um, RPGs, and wore that kind of thing on their sleeve. There was a there's a section in the Storyteller's Guide in Second Edition called "An Owl Form the Head." That partic that um, embracing of the over the top mythic mythology type status of the game because you literally are demigods you shouldn't be going going in and doing dungeon crawls the way the way you would in a, in a more standardized fantasy game is the com is so antithetical to a, to the identity this is me this was meant to embrace that kind of over the topness and whether or not it did so successfully mechanically is another conversation that is not that interesting to me at the, at this moment. It's more the fact that they tried to all of the mythological and all the anime stuff they tried to scrub from the presentation. Even just not second edition, they worked with Udon. You know the people who do the, those comics for um, Capcom and a, and a bunch of other folks. And in second edition, there were these little mini comics in between the chapters that helped really hammer home the kind of world that Exalted was going for. And a lot of that was excised, yeah. and it just comes off like a like a high fantasy setting. Like, it's taking itself... It's trying to take itself seriously. And, yeah, there can be some serious storytelling in Exalted, but it's trying to do... It's, But they've... But in 2nd and 1st edition, they specifically said that what they were trying to do was mythic fantasy. And... Sure. That, that's the reason why I say that third edition and its simplified cousin essence missed the point. Yeah, it sounds like like a, a, a classic example of destroying a thing because you tried to take it more seriously than uh, it was ever meant to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm not um, I'm not trying to say that the game was jokey. This wasn't Gamma World or Tune or something like that. But yeah. The, but um, trying to trying to do a more grounded take, which I've seen some people praise, is a case of is a case of missing the point. If I want a 
if I want a grounded take, I'm not playing a game called Exalted. I mean, it's it's kind of in the damn name. Yeah. You know, it, you know, to to exalt, to lift up. Yeah. I don't know. I I always uh, I keep playing around with various ways to make my own sort of sort of bring a simplified version of like that sort of mythic feel of a very high powered um um uh, characters to uh, more OSR type games. Um, I don't know. A lot of a lot of my opinion of, of those types of systems, those type of att attempts, is that they um, they try and systematize uh, all of the weird powers rather than building a framework in which you can build your own weird powers. Um, whereas my impulse is always to build a framework in which you can build your own weird weird powers, or even a system in which it's okay to have uh, um, freeform weird powers. Like, um, so in Lords of Ur, which I'm hopefully going to be, re be releasing within a month, um, um, I'm more or less done with playtesting. I just sort of need to get all of the illustrations in um, and make some decisions about its art direction. Um, but, like, one of the main ways... I think the main way you would advance in Lords of Ur um, is by getting criticals. Um... And through getting criticals, you you get to describe a new power that you've just developed, um, and that's that's how and you get to describe. Hey, so that's that's how I accomplished this task. Um, so uh, it, it's it's sort of limited limited in certain ways. It's not on every critical, but that's that's a mechanical intricacy. Um, but. It, it it allows for a fairly um, freeform way to put weird powers in, which I, I saw as pretty necessary for something that's doing um, sort of a world, a mythic Sumerian world, um, in which you can, I don't know, it, it the land of myths is one in which you can just say, yeah, this guy has giant hands, so he can, he can paddle a sailboat, or um, bitch slap three guys at once, and... You just sort of go with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, the only thing, um, I, the only comment I could make on that on that sort of thing is, it's important to provide some sort of guidance whenever you're giving a table a blank check. Oh, um, that's part of the reason why fate is <laughs> has been my whipping boy. Not not because not because of some of the comments that Evil Hat has made over the years, although that certainly doesn't help, but. The fact that so much of it is built on the descriptive tags that that is at the core of their aspect system, but in terms of giving players proper guidance as far as what would be a good example of an aspect versus a bad example of an aspect, um, that's never that's never given in Fate Core, and certainly not in Accelerated or Condensed. Yeah, that's that's definitely an issue with um, with fate. Um, I think part of the reason that it it um, comes up so weirdly for uh, fate is that fate gives. So okay, so. I have a number of mechanical issues with fate, uh, but one thing that I think could fix some of fate's aspect issues is if you had more of a custom character creation system that like varied between um, uh, fate playsets, where you had them like answer questions about your character, and the answers to the questions were your aspects, like. Um, 
you know, uh, I don't know, you, you could, you, if you, in a, in a particularly dark game, the questions could be, why do you hate the Quaylons more than you love life itself? Um, uh, I can um, see where, you, I can see where you're going with that. Um, yeah. And we do kind of, we do kind of have that with some of the playbooks in certain Powered by the Apocalypse games, where they are asking those, yes. kind, those kind of questions. Though th there's one particular pro there's one particular um, roadblock that happens with that. At the yeah. end of the day, Fate is intended to be a universalist game, much in the same way yes. GURPS, yes, Hero, or Savage Worlds are universalist games. So those sort of questions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it would be very diff it's very difficult to have those kind of questions in a way that that is um, still keeping to that universality because. Otherwise, they be otherwise they're questions that are very setting or setting or genre specific, and yeah, that and that further brings into the whole a big guidance is a big thing with me when it comes to those sort of blank checks because it's important yeah. to make clear what um what you ca what can and can't be what um is pushing it a little bit pushing it a little bit too far. Like you don't want to get you don't want somebody to get a power that's just I ought that's just I auto win or a aspect that automatically applies in every single situation, and just sit and just telling people, oh you oh you you can you can figure out what works and what doesn't at at the table, doesn't quite work when every game is someone's first and relying on veterancy to sol to solve a problem is not advisable. Because you're assu you're assuming that you're yeah. dealing with a level of experience. Yeah, I don't know. Um, feats sort of work in Lords of Ur. I, the only limits I put on on feats in, in Lords of Ur are uh, feats cannot directly kill, see the future, tele teleport beyond the hex you are currently in, or bring back the dead. Um, and that that kind of works because Lords of Ur um, is more a game about um, like building infrastructure pro projects than it is a game about like uh, fighting people. Like you absolutely are going to fight people, and there've been great combats in Lords of Ur during the playtests. Um, but like, even the fights are more like I'm going to go to this city. I'm going to kill its king, and then I'm going to escape, then, like, I'm going to fight the dragon, and it needs to be epic and take an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I don't know, I think it's fine to give players really overpowered powers, as long as the powers are overpowered for things that do not matter to the game that they're actually playing. The, uh, um, the, other, the other end of it is um, choice paralysis. When you're get when you're yeah. giving that blank check, and that's the other reason why yeah. guidance is something that it that is fo is should be a major focus, since yeah. when you when when you get when you are giving someone potentially infinite options in the form of say aspects or in the or in the form of of a full free form power setup, the yeah. there is. There is the analysis paralysis that can come in because there were there's a worry that a choice that they make now might screw them over a few sessions down the road. So, Lords of Earth sort of uh, avoids that problem by having all of the feats be things that you acquire right now in the moment that would help you with something you've just rolled a critical on. So, like they're always going to be hyper specific and restricted in in terms of that and it's never going to be like oh i'm making the ideal character build mhm mm I, I don't know it's not i think i found a way to to dodge all of these issues but yes they they are all um issues that can very easily come up in games yeah oh and whenever I whenever I bring up the guidance thing with with fans of more narrativist games, um, I usually end up getting strawmanned. 
Oh. Um, <laughs> in in me when me when me talking about this guidance issue with with certain games, I usually hear some romanticism about. Oh, it's oh, it's, tr it's trusting that the table can figure it out on their own, which is the equivalent of pushing someone into the deep end of, of the water and saying, swim, damn it. Uh, to reference an old Penny Arcade script, um, s strip. Or I have people saying, well, if you if you want something a bit more prepackaged, maybe you'd pr maybe you'd prefer D maybe you prefer D and D five E. And I'm like, I never said I wanted something more prepackaged. I uh, so. I think the irony here is I'm, I'm aware that people who like story game, story gamers, they, they tend to insist that they are doing um, the more uh, freeform thing, but uh, story games in my experience um, I've read a fair amount of them um, and, and played a fair amount of them as well. I, I want to people tend to assume that I only do one thing um, but in my experience, they tend to have, I would say, more guidance and be far more on rails than more sandboxy trad games. Um, I, I really don't like the, the 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 line that people make between story game and tr and trad. It's so it's so artificial. Um, especially especially as I've delved more and more into making my own stuff. Um, but in my in my exper in my experience. Um, every every game is every game is someone's first, like I mentioned before, and understanding that that first time table experience is just is just as important. But for but for me, the reason why the the um, straw man thing kind of annoys me is it is assume it is assuming the direct opposite extreme. Just because of critique of um, of a guidance issue, i.e., me saying lack of guidance some somehow translates to wanting handholding or wanting railroading when that's never the case. Yeah, um, I mean, in a sense, I I would say even any skill list or ability or or, or ability list or whatever is a form of guidance in a game without handholding. Because if you have ten skills in the game, in a sense, that's a that's a ten item menu of ways that your character you you can just look down at it and know. Okay, situation. I can do any of these ten things. Maybe more than these ten things, but this is my starting point. Whereas if you don't have the the skill list and get helpfully told, I can do anything. You'll you might you might easily go. Uh, I don't, I don't know what this game is about. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I don't like. And I, I think that I think that a I lot of people I, I, when I, they when they have a degree of veterancy with tabletop gaming end up, um, end up forgetting that they were at one point a, a rookie to the hobby. I, I mean. I've 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 also seen people who've been gaming with me for like ten years go through um, this uh, that that issue of paralysis and not knowing what to do. Um, I, I I have two points to make here. First is that uh, it's probably a bad idea for an indie designer to try and design someone's first role playing game. Um, and second, that there's two kinds of players. Uh, um, and no one likes to acknowledge that there's two kinds of players because it's very rude and unpleasant to point out. Um, I'll, I'll make the first one first. By the time someone encounters my itch page, um, they have almost certainly played multiple other role-playing game systems before they've, they've ever, just, just, to even know who I am, you pretty much have to have played multiple role-playing game systems. And if you know who I am and you haven't played multiple role-playing game systems, I would genuinely be fascinated to hear how you have found yourself buying um, 
I don't know, the Evil Undead campaign. Um, because that... That just doesn't seem... It just doesn't seem real to me. Like, I... it's It seems unaware of my position in, in life in the world to think that anyone encountering me hasn't already played at least Dungeons & Dragons, if not multiple editions of that, if not probably Dungeons and & Dragons and a huge number of other things. Um, just because I'm, I'm in the Little Leagues, um, at least. I don't, I don't know if you consider yourself as being in the Little Leagues. I'm not going to be on Walmart's shelf. No kid is going to be picking up my book looking at it and saying, mommy, mommy, I want to get this. That's, um, I don't, I don't think that's the world I live in. I, um, as on that, on that particular spectrum, I consider myself a radical independent, um, just in, ter just in terms of how I've operated. And it is funny you bring that kind of thing up because over the last few years, I have, de I have dove in more and more into the um, TTRPG space and how it developed in Japan. And okay. A lot, because a lot of the, a lot of the assumptions that people might have when it comes to TTRPG design in the West don't really apply over there. the The way the way think the way things developed, the way things evolved, it it did not go along the same paths. Um. Now, the bi the biggest homegrown ex the biggest homegrown um, TTRPG in Japan is of course Sword World. Sword World was technically, but also not born out of the Lodos campaign. And yes, Lodos originally was a um, basic D basic D and D replay. Um, replays, if you're not familiar, yeah. are um, kind of like an actual play in yeah, text form. Um, they did group SNE, which was publishing the Lodos material, did want to try and make the Lo the Lodos um, setting into an official D and D campaign setting for Japan, but TSR wasn't playing ball with them either. Leave either they're, they're just not communicating or some or something, so they scrambled to use the rules that they had made for a PC adaptation of The Grey Witch, the first Lodos novel by Ryo Mizuno, and turned that into a, ga a game form, which would become Sword World. Um, a lot of the traditions about miniatures and the wargaming ancestry, that never really... Wargaming didn't really take root, and then that, become, that became TTRPGs. That's not how it worked over there. If anything... Computer RPGs got a lot of popularity, and th and through that you end up getting TTRPGs in Japan. One of the earliest examples was a adaptation of the Wizardry games, because Wizardry was really big in Japan, and led to a chain of events that would lead to the creation of Dragon Quest. But that's another story. But it did get a TTRPG adaptation in 1988. Now, as far as how mm -hmm. that played, I can't. I can't really say because I have because nobody's translated it. I've, I've tried to push a few people to see if they'd be willing to translate it, but so far, so far, nobody's bit. Uh, mm. And the moreover, the idea of one particular system having this, dom having this dominant footprint over everything else isn't really a thing. Mm. Uh, if it, if any if anything you're you're going to if some if somebody's putting out say a a um adaptation of I'll use Sword Art Online as as an example because that's actually happened. There's not mm -hmm. an assumption that it's going to be using an established system like D and D or Savage Worlds or anything like that. It's probably going to be using an in-house system, possibly using okay. D sixes because those are the easiest dice to acquire. Um. Yeah, that's where the S A B C D E uh, rank scaling comes from. Um, the you all, there's also the fact that most of, mo, Sword World wasn't put in, and and 
other games subsequently wasn't put in like dedicated hobby stores in the same sense they were put in bookstores oh oh and as far as why D and D didn't have a foothold, even though it did, even though it did go to Japan at one point, and the yeah. we have scans of say the Japanese version of the Rule Cyclopedia, which is di is different artistically. Like mm. none of none of the art from the original Rule Cyclopedia was used in the Japanese version, and in fact, it was the original Rule Cyclopedia was split into three books over there. Mostly because of the fact that it's using a small, a smaller um, page size. It's not using the standard A4. I think it was B6. Don't quote me on the numbers. It's the page size mm. that's used for like large manga volumes. Mm. Oh. And ob obviously, obviously, you obviously using a 2D6 based approach. But D and D, but um, D and D. First, the indie first edition, like the Beck Me era, that did go over. For the longest time, AD and D didn't, and mm. there was an attempt sometime down the road, but it was a very long attempt and very expensive. And by the time it finally came out, Tunnels and Trolls had come out in Japan and kind of stole its thunder. <laughs> and All right. And and hell the big the biggest um the biggest Western TTRPG um in Japan is Call of Cthulhu. Yeah. Which of which of course uses a uses the basic system which is using D one hundreds. Um. Yes. I know that contradicts the whole D six thing, but you look at a lot of them, you're going to see a lot of D sixes. There's some exceptions, but not many. And yeah, yeah more. That that also led to a working relationship that Group SNE had with FASA, who, which is mm -hmm. how Japan got stuff like Earth Dawn and Shadowrun, and even to this day, Earth Dawn still has a pretty dedicated fan following in Japan. What especially oh. helped was that the the Japanese versions of the books used completely different art. A lot of it done. A lot of it done by some very famous. Um, manga artists and, mo and monster designers for various tokusatsu shows. Mm. Um, one of the big ones was Keita Amamiya. Who's... He has, the, he, he has done a lot of mo a lot of monster designs for various tokusatsu going all the way back to the 90s, as well as directed a bunch of, a bunch of projects. His big claim to fame, and most recently, has been the Garo series. Um, but he's the, as well as as well as handling two as well as handling um, two of the three films during the Dark Age of Common Rider, um, Zeto and J. Okay, but. He has a he has a very distinct um, style, and that was brought over to Earth Dawn. And sure. The because of because of all of those all of those thing all of those different um, elements, um, D and D did eventually head back to Japan. I've I've I remember at one point having a Japanese version of I think it, I think it was fourth edition. And I know fifth edition has been brought over. There's been there's been attempts to try and to try and um, make more inroads. Between D and D five E and and the Japanese audience, but it's the but the problem is the culture just the culture just isn't going to have that same input, and the way games yeah. are played isn't going to work either because a lot of Jap a lot of Japanese tabletop very much favors um, one shots. Lar this is oh. largely born out of the fact that. A lot of people that instead of playing at a table in somebody's house or something like that, a lot of times people are renting a karaoke bar, or a karaoke room, I should say. Okay. And because because of that, obviously, t obviously, time is certainly going to be a factor. So you look around sure. enough you in the that scene, you're going to see a lot of very short, very short one shot, one shot based designs that you could, that could eat. 
modules that could easily be run in less than three hours. Right. Um, That's interesting. And what's what I find what I find fascinating is the sp is that the closest parallel I can make with the Japanese tabletop scene is that it's a lot closer to the indie scene here in here in the West. Mm. Because you have a lot of people who are more interested in making their own in-house systems than trying to than trying to um, use an, use an already established one. Um, sure. Like, I know I've seen some people be bring up the similarities between Sword World and the Goblin Slayer TTRPG. There are similarities, I will admit, and they do kind of use the same die resolution mechanic, but in the in-between parts, the soft factors, they're not compatible. Mm. Oh. Like, what do you mean by soft factors and in-between parts? Classes, races, spell casting, spell lists, mon monster mechanics, oh. um, advancement, oh. all different. All right. It's... This, the same DNA is there, but it's a different fork. And I do remember, I do remember when that thing was was brought stateside by Yen Press, and people were like, "Why didn't they use D and D for this?" Well, D and D doesn't have that kind of foothold in Japan. It ha mm. it hasn't since like the eighties. It added. It, it added... must be nice for Japanese designers. <laughs> um, and... you're making me want to learn. Learn Japanese right now. Yes, there, <laughs> there's for the longest time it was very hard to to get even fan translations of of Japanese tabletop, but it's gotten slightly easier, especially since Lion Wing has has um helped push that forward with what they've been putting out. Um, I mentioned this yeah. before we went live, but but they are of course doing the translation for the Shin Megami Tensei RPG, which. The full name for it is Shin Megami Tensei RPG Tokyo Conception because it's based on um, Nocturne instead instead of any, instead of trying to base it on all of Mega Ten at once that would be a bit of an ask. <laughs> mm. But that system is that is using a percentile die approach, which again, given the popularity of basic role playing, certainly makes sense. Um, that. There, um, a while back, they had done Convictor Drive, which I've seen a lot of people say it's the tabletop version, of a tabletop um, common writer RPG. Mm. I have I have confirmation from Word of God that it's take that its bigger inspiration was Iron Man, with a little bit of the Metal Heroes era of Togusats, especially what's known as the Space Sheriff trilogy. Um, okay. And there ha there have there have been plenty of TTRPG adaptations of say video games or or manga and even and some more unorthodox ideas. Um one of the first Japanese tabletop to get translated into English was Ryo Kamiya's Made RPG. Which was him doing one giant piss take on the ma on the maid cafe phenomenon in Japan. Mm. It's it's weird, but what the maid RPG? I'm talking about yeah. uh, maid RPG? Yeah, yeah, and I've AID. played it. Yeah, that was that... yeah, I've played it. I en I ended up call I ended up calling out um one of Katakawa's Twitter accounts when they tried to claim that the Konosuba TTRPG was the first Japanese tabletop translated into English. What? That's not true. No. Made <laughs> got translated in 2008. They made mm. that tweet in 2022. And yeah, part of it was because they because the because they were having the Trash Taste podcast do a one-shot stream of the, of the game, but whoever was responsible for the Twitter account, I hope they got a dressing down over that <laughs> cuz lord knows I would have. Mm. Cuz I mean, it's 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 not like you could it's not like you, you couldn't check and even even if you want to say that that was too small, shortly after that we got Tenra, which which um 
was a much bigger deal, and Tenra is an interesting mm. beast in and of itself. Uh, sure. I, I guess I could describe Tenra as futuristic meets feudal. Mm. I mean, you have, you, you have you have it taking place in what looks like a a a samurai punk feudal um, Japanese setting. But it has things like sh like Shinto's tapping into a um ka a internet of kami kind of thing, uh, having have um have robots that have s the souls of people who died violent deaths in the in these mechanized bodies. You do, and of course you do have mecha, and even p even soldiers who specialize in hunting mecha. Mm. Uh, it's it's an the because of, because of the fact that there isn't this one one system to rule them all mindset is what I find fascinating about th about that particular um, area of the world and how it's developed the tabletop thing it's, especially since there's this mindset among some folk that we're not supposed to be taking inspiration from video games for TTRPGs. I would mostly agree with that one. Um, I, I, or in, in some cases, I've seen some people say that, it, that you shouldn't be taking inspiration from manga. Um, I, that's not true. And I, I do think that tabletop role-playing games are their own medium, and have it, their own strengths and weaknesses, and you should pay attention to that. And it's probably a bad idea to compete with another medium on their own territory. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that nearly as strongly for manga versus video games. Because I, I don't feel like the, the competition is as direct. Well, sometimes it's not even an... I, I've seen some arguments where it's not even an issue of competition, but just draw... But just, um having ideas that are inspired by video by video games or by ma or by manga and i f i find and i remember when that was brought up to me years ago and i found it ridiculous because you're going you're because i had said at the time you're going to have whole generations who got their introduction to fantasy not through tolkien or through or through um Moorcock or th or through lieber or any of, or any of the classic um, entries, they may have gotten their introduction through the likes of Harry Potter or through Slayers or, or um. And I mean, Final you Fantasy. say going to that that generation is already very much there. Uh, it was it wasn't I quite, mean... it wasn't quite there at the time I had this discussion, and okay. I had said you're gonna have a whole generation who that that was their inspiration, and some of those people are going to pursue. Making ga making games based on that inspiration, and they're gonna yeah. base it on what they know in the same way that, say, Tarant a lot of Tarantino's work was heavily inspired by the kind of grindhouse style cinema he grew up watching. Yeah. Or yeah, oh, a lot of Lucas and Spielberg's movies were based on the serial adventure type type of cinema that they saw growing up. Which is which is the reason why you can yeah. find so many references and in, say in Indiana Indiana Jones and um, Star Wars. Um, the um, um, a lot of Stan Lee's early work was heavily inspired by him growing up reading Doc Savage. Yeah, there's a lot of people, especially on the internet, who will do what I've termed uh, getting confused that other people are not nostalgic for their childhood. It's it's weird to me that so many people who are otherwise intelligent can make this mistake, but a lot of people think of their nostalgia as being the eternal source of all nostalgia, and can't, can't contemplate that because they are, are 50, and I am nearly 30, um, the things I am nostalgic for will be 20 years after the things they are nostalgic for. 
And so they'll say things to me like, how could you not know this? How could this not be the iconic D&D image to you? I'd be like, sir, that came out 25 years before I was born. I didn't see it until my late 20s. It's a historical piece to me. Oh. Um... Or they'll they'll be like ah, but you need you need to love the greats of da da da. Like, do you love the greats that I know as the greats? And they're like, no, I've never heard of them. You want to know what's one that's way to not really my piss, stuff? You want to know what's really what's a really good way to piss off a music snob? What? Tell them that everything classical was once pop. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was. Um, although there's there's. To be fair, some stuff that was once uh, was once classical was actually um, uh, originally meant to be exclusively performed, but uh, for the pleasure of the uber rich. Which I don't know if that makes it pop, but it I don't know. It's it's a genre we don't really have anymore. Um, uh, what? But yeah, uh, like to me, um, Abhorson. Mm -hmm. That's that's a foundational text. Avatar The Last Airbender? That's a foundational text. Um, that is a thing I grew up with. It inspires me. Mm -hmm. um, not heavily. It doesn't show up a lot. I'm not going to make a series of four different bender classes, but it's probably somewhere in my brain when I make stuff. The DNA um, is still going to be there. You, no, matter yeah. how much you tr no matter how much you train to catch a ball with your right hand. If you're left-handed, you're always going to be left-handed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, I... Um, there's there's less typical stuff that I would say is, is just as foundational for me, if not more foundational. Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. That's really... That's, that's going to be in my head when I'm making... Almost anything. It's not gonna. I'm not gonna think. Oh, I'm gonna make this because this is like dream and da da da. And I like that character. Blah blah. blah. But like somewhere deep in my subconscious, yeah, a hundred percent. It's gonna be influencing me. Um, I've uh, I've been very critical of how a lot of people view fantasy. In the, yeah? in the since we're talking about foundational text, this is something that came to mind. Go away. Is how a lot how there's this idea that if you're if you're doing high fantasy then you either have you either have to be taking no notes from Tolkien or notes from um Howard and for me personally I have I have no interest in doing that not not to say that those works aren't foundational to me it's just I've been down that road before um uh, and I don't like the idea. I've res always resented the idea of doing things just because that's the tradition. Um, designed by gospel is what I call it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's no good. Look, I'm not. I don't think that everything traditional is bad. Um, it's traditional to eat three times a day. It's traditional to to wear shoes when you go outside. It's traditional to look both ways before you cross the street. All of most traditions, I would say 99% of traditions, we don't even think about tr as being traditions because no one thinks to question them because they're just smart ideas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, e eat your vegetables. Like, sure, now we know why it's a good idea, but eat your vegetables used to just be a tradition. It turned out to be true. Most traditions when turn out to be useful. When everybody was most traditions. When everybody at the table was complaining about having to eat the vegetables, I was always like, all right, fine, more for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, part of that's just, there's a whole conversation to be had there about food sources and uh, the effects of industrialization on... Um, I'm, not a, I'm, not enough of a, I'm not enough of that kind of scholar to have that conversation, and I don't have enough alcohol. Doesn't matter. It. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. I won't go into it. Um, but... Uh, the the headline item is just for various reasons. Three hundred years ago, vegetables tasted better, um, and now they're starting to taste better again. So it's fine. Um, but regardless, uh, uh, I'm I don't know. Question tradition, but be willing to accept that tradition 
might have a lot to say to you that has a lot of value. Um, anyways, um, how did we get get onto the subject of, of tradition? Um, it lar- it largely it it was largely the whole the whole thing of, like I said, the fa- the fantasy pastiche issue. Um, like a lot a lot of folks having this idea that you have to do. If you're do if you're doing fantasy, it has it's for some reason has to be in e- either a, either a poor man's Tolkien or a poor man's Co- or a poor man's Conan. Not because it's an I- not because it's a good idea, not because it's something that you'd want to do, but because because that's what's expected because reasons. Yeah, and that's that's stupid. That's stupid. You should listen. I okay. Here's what I will say on that. Um, Tolkien and Co- uh, Tolkien and Howard they didn't know that they were writing Tolkien and Howard. Um, Tolkien thought that he was writing. I I I, I was actually I, I actually just did a Twitter thread on this, pointing out that Tolkien gets uh, held up as the king of the world builders, <laughs> but Tolkien did not think he was world building because Tolkien did not know what world building was. Tolkien thought that he really loved languages and really loved fairy tales, so he invented some languages and then wrote some fairy tales to put them in. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why his stuff feels so weird to modern world builders. Like, I, I pointed out a huge list of things wrong with with uh, um, Middle Earth, if we try and take it as a world building project, which again it was never meant to be, so it shouldn't be judged on those on that criteria. But if you were judging it on that, you'd notice things like the Mirkwood is in a rain shadow. Um, which again, Tolkien would just if I pointed this out, if Tolkien were alive today and I pointed this out to them, out to him, he'd call me a nerd and then start talking about the intricacies of Finnish grammar. I just have to deal with it. Um, he didn't care about rain shadows. That's why Merkwood is in a rain shadow. Um, uh, one of my anyway. um, one of one of my mantras that I have in the temple is believability over realism. Sure. And part of I know I know one. It would be easy to say that 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 those two are the same, but what I what I mean by that kind of ties into the tagline that was used for the first Superman movie: "You will believe that a man can fly." Oh, uh, yeah. It's this the belief that the the audience wants to be tricked, and it's your jo- it's your job as the storyteller or, or the designer to put to bring that to bring them into that world. So. A lot of a lot of things that I see some people who talk about world building focus on, I end up thinking you you guys are focusing on the wrong things. The if you're if you're in a if you're in a vine covered forest, the the reader the the players the aren't really gonna aren't really going to care about the thickness of the vines or how long each of the vines is. You're in you're in a for, you're in a forest surrounded by vines. That's what they're going to care about. I so the reason I specifically on a personal level care about and notice where rain shadows are supposed to be on a map and think about them in an inordinate amount is because I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, in which uh, the subject of where is the rain shadow um, is a huge factor that impacts the entire region and its layout. I'm sure you'd you'd also care a huge amount about uh, lake effect if you grew up uh, in the Great Lakes region. Mm-hmm. Well, I well I did, but well, do you? Would it really really bother you if there was a fantasy setting that had Great Lakes in it and no lake effect? Mm. It's a... would you at least note it? I'd prob I'd probably treat it the way I treat. Um, gun inaccuracies that I see in films, I'd I'd have a few laughs about it, and that'd be the end of it. Just like ha ha, right, they didn't but... ha they didn't get they didn't get that in, and it would I wouldn't have it as some sort of de- as some sort of deal breaker. 
Uh, I'm not saying it's a deal breaker for me. I'm saying that it it's it you would you would take it just as I take it. You would take your thing just as I take my thing as an example of well, they didn't think about this part of the world very much. It must not be that important to them. Yeah. Um, but, I think, and, and I, similarly, if you were going to if you were going to write a, a hex crawl and it had lakes in it, you would put a lake effect in, right? Yeah, if I was writing a hex crawl, which if I'm being if I'm being honest, um, I don't see myself doing any anytime soon because that's not that's just not the style that I lean into. Fair enough. Uh, the the meth the method to the madness, as as it were, that I le that I have more of a lean have more of a leaning towards is is um is writing is writing things as if I'm writing a um a for, a format for a television show not in terms of having a full on script but having just these broad bullet points for each um act and treating a session like a episode um especially mm -hmm. since I've used something that I will freely admit I blatantly stole from the production team of um Gargoyles and that is tears and tent poles. Yeah. Uh, this w tears and tent poles was a compromise that the writers of Gargoyles had with Disney because of the fact that around this time doing full serialization was not was not a popular idea among um, television stations. They really, mm. really don't like serialization. Because they like being right. able to throw any episode they want on a given time slot. Yeah. So the way that the way that it worked was that there were certain episodes that could be put in any order, but only between specific threshold episodes. And mm. in the same vein, I in the same vein there there are there there are important parts of a give of a given mo of a given module or set or sessions that I will write that I can swap I can swap around at any time in between the larger beats I am and continue to be an extreme sandbox purist um but I think that that's a fairly good way to run a uh, more structured campaign if that's really what you want to do. Uh, a lot of a lot of the players that I work with are players that are very very new to the concept, and mm. because they're very new, it requires me to be more hands on. The same way I I have to be more direct and hands on when I'm dealing with people who I'm interviewing for whom English is not their first language. And it requires a bit more effort on my end to coke to um help guide them through it. Um, that makes sense. The but I've I may I will make clear of course that that's just my style and I've I I've, I've never treated my style as the as the style or the tr or the true way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just treat it at, I just treat it as what what works for me may not work for you but my, but what i'm doing is no better than what anyone else is doing this is optimized for the tables that i run and the people that i run it with because one of my goals has always has always been showcasing what is out there in the totality of tabletop role playing games uh, mm -hmm. and that totality will will take will take me into more unorthodox places at times. Um, well, with the when it, when I've written the definition of an RPG, I don't I don't bring up um, using um, dice because I've run di I've run mm. diceless games and I've run games that use randomizers but don't use dice, like um, sure. Dragonlance Fifth Age. That that mm. was one of the two games for TSR's Saga system. And that uses a card system instead of using dice. Oh. Mm. It it kind of has a spiritual successor in the games made by Tab Creations under the Saga Machine umbrella. It's it which is using a standard playing card deck. Oh. And of course, of course, the of course, even the even um dice is optional because I've 
I've run Amber. Amber is one of the big examples of a diceless game. Um, mm -hmm. And none of none of these approaches, whether they be narrative, whether they be whether they be more war gamey, whether they le whether they have some elements of board games, whether they have some el some elements of some of some other concept, whether they're theater of the mind, whether they're sandbox, none of them are more valuable than the, than the other. It's just a matter of who is who is it going to be a better fit for. You know, think of it like um, mm. a tailor. You go to a you go to a tailor sure. to get fitted for a suit. They they are going to take your measurements and get a suit ready that fits not just your measurements but the kind of event that you're going to be going to. Of course. You know, uh, the since not a lot of people have been to a tailor, huh. I always bring up the tailor scene in John Wick Chapter Two. Mm. You know where he's specifically asking for a a evening suit for a social for a social affair in Italian style with two buttons. Yeah, um so it is worth noting that that might not actually be that representative of the experience of actually going to a tailor. I don't know if you've you've been to one? I ha I have. It's just a lot of people have it and that's the closest um equip that's the closest equivalent I can bring up in popular culture. So in Southeast Asia, going to a tailor is much, much cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, you can get an outfit tailored for about 300 baht in Bangkok, um, where I currently am. Uh, and that's... Oh, let me do some math. That, um, that's about... Uh, seven and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seven and a half dollars or so. Um, and um, most of what they'll do is they'll take uh, they'll take uh your outfit and they'll make it actually fit you. So an interesting fact about um industrialization is it made clothing so much cheaper, orders of magnitude cheaper. Uh, people don't appreciate enough that. Industrialization means that they get to have cheap clothing. They just take that for granted because that clothing's always been cheap to them. Um, but it's it's absolutely a, a factor of industrialization, and uh, a, a consequence of all this cheap clothing is we are living in the only period in human history where um, people's clothes don't fit them um, because. Once upon a time, for basically the entirety of human history, all clothing was custom made, and so therefore it automatically fit. Um, if it didn't fit, it was because you were wearing someone else's clothing that had been custom made for them. Uh, which wasn't that uncommon, because clothing was so expensive that inheriting someone else's clothing was a major windfall. Um... Anyways, um, so going to a tailor, at least in my experience, is more about going in and then taking your everyday clothing and making it fit you. Um, it's not that custom made or Baroque. Maybe it is in the West, but I could never afford to go to a tailor in the West. I, ha I have. Um, and... Yeah. Because because of the fact that that film is is widespread, and because of the context of that particular scene, that's what I've used as my analogy. Um, and yeah, it's it's not Stop. it's not going to be one hundred percent perfect, but it's a ca it's a case of good enough is good enough. Um, okay, sorry. And I probably took that more literally than I should have. <laughs> uh, but I will. I've, uh, I will free. I will freely admit that there are there are some um, there are some types of means of die resolution means of um, resolution in games that I I do think some people over, I do think some people overlook um, 
Especially when sure. it comes to cards. I, re I really feel that yeah. the full potential of cards as a resolution mechanic has not been fully explored. Because even with the vast amount of yeah. games I have in my library, there's only a handful that I have that utilize cards. And whenever I say that, somebody says, well, Savage Worlds uses it for its initiative. That doesn't count and you know it. <laughs> yeah, that's not unimaginative. I... I so a thing that I've wanted to see happen is getting, I know this is going to sound stupid Try me. Uh, and cliched, but getting cards into the OSR. So here's my idea. So so obviously we, we both know the only people who use cards for their games are people who are trying to make, make Wild West cowboy games and don't understand that just because uh, mechanics have a theme doesn't mean that they'll be good mechanics. Um, but here's what cards are good for. Cards as a randomizer mean that you can control when you spend your rolls. You know what your rolls are ahead of time and you can spend them, which makes it amazing as a mechanic for a game that's really heavy on themes of fate, predestination, um, and uh, like manipulation of reality. So... Um, I've always wanted to see more card use in the OSR. If I remember correctly, um, uh, the author of Lone Wolf Fists, uh, Joel, who you've had on, on, on your show a few times, I believe, um, he actually did a card-based OSR thing um, at one point, much along these lines. I've always wanted to get around to like doing my own, something like that. I, I don't suggest, entirely know. I did suggest to him at one point to look at the die system that he has as a um, as a ha as a hand of cards, especially since he's using d10s. Oh. Um, That's interesting. The did he? Um, he d he didn't. He's still he's it's still using it's still a d10 die pool because because that's what he wanted to do and not. And I was most I was mostly referring to the fact that I think I think a lot of people mis uh, misconstrued the die the die system that he's going with because the, because their idea is you roll your you roll your dice for when you're do you roll your die pool when you're doing a given action which is certainly something that can be done but it could also but it could also be you're rolling your die in advance and then you're spending the sets on the type of action you want to do and the degree of action you want to do. Um, you could. Um, I don't know... Which system did he, did he do this for? Um, the, this, would be for, this would be for Lone Wolf Fists. And the key yeah. thing with, the, with how Lone Wolf Fist works is that it's not about rolling high or rolling low, although that can certainly help. It's about rolling sets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know, I know. I'm just trying to get a refresher on this, make yeah. sure I'm talking about the right game. I would want to talk to Joel personally and ask him, hey, Joel, why'd you do this? Because I'm sure that would be an interesting conversation, because it always is. Well, I, um, I, do know, but... I do know that a large chunk of the rolling and sets thing is is largely because of what it's, um, what the, what this gate, what Lone Wolf Fist is succeeding. Um, yeah, I know. But, but I I bet I bet the why why did you only have the have dice get rolled when the player announces an action rather than when the GM announces something? Um, um, I don't think I don't think that I was I don't think that was in there. Oh, it wasn't. I think I think you I think you I think <laughs> I think I think it's been years a, since I read this game. Yeah, it, there was a and there I never got of, to play there was a bit of cross wiring there. Um, what I'm what I'm talking about is how is how the die are is how the die are used, and and yeah. um, more but more on point. Um, there are a yeah. there are a couple ga there are a couple games that I can think of that would serve as a good foundation, even if the die even if the um, cards that they use might be might be a bit might be a bit unorthodox for some. Um, now, as far as far as the whole as far as using a hand of cards in that kind of thing there's already a, there's already a fair few games that take that approach 
Um, Saga system mm. did that. In fact, it had it, that your hand was both your level and your health. Um, mm. Westbound Dust and Dragons does a does a similar thing, though with though with a different approach. There was also mm. um, a game that was built more to emulate um, Shonen Battle Manga called Shonen Final Burst. That was made a few years ago, where your um, where you would use straights for your attacks and sets for your defenses. <clears throat> oh. I'm vastly simplifying what what it did, but that's that is a major gist of how it worked, and having everyone mm -hmm. have their own deck as a um, he as a health system. Um, there's also been parcelings, which is more is more of an is bringing in elements of an expanding almost deck builder like design with its approach and really doubling down on creating these combined hands because it is it is a game where war where um words are magic and creating creating work creating words as a group is how you do spells in that game um, sure. and as far as a direct thing, when you're bringing up fates, the big thing that comes to mind is going to be Everway, which mm. made it come, which has been around for quite a while. It was a very early pre D and D Wizard of the Wizard of the Coast project. Like we're mm. we're talking late '90s, um, by yeah. Jonathan Tweet, and it was very it was very much ahead of its time because it because it was a very narrativist game, though. And one one that has been influential by a, to a lot of designers today, to the point where I um compare I compared it to the shape of Punk to Come by Refused in the sense of it being, it ha it having a bit a bit iffy of a um of a reception early on, but became a massive influence. Um, mm. but that ga that particular game did not have. A, did not have the typical pass fail resolution approach, but instead mm. had a tarot inspired deck called the fortune deck. Mm. When you were again, you're, when you were going to be taking an action, um, you would dr you would draw the top card from the deck, and that would serve as kind of a cue for what happens next. And what, yeah. whether that whether that it. Now, whether that is a pass or a fail ultimately depended on the interp the way the card is interpreted. So, much like mm. how someone doing a tarot reading is interpreting the cards that get drawn. Yeah. Um, I'm coming up on my time limit here. <laughs> yeah, sorry about sorry about that. I get time flies you, as yeah. <laughs> as it, as it were. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. But I, I do have to go very soon. All right. Well, I do I do want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple. And anytime sure, you see sure, fit to return, the door is always open. All right. I'll let you know. Okay. Yep. And and um, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, right. on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>